Wyoming legislature. Prior to being elected to Congress, Harriet worked as a water, natural resource, and constitutional attorney. Congresswoman Hagan serves on the Judiciary and Natural Resources Com Committee. Please join me in welcoming home United States Congresswoman Harriet Hageman. It is wonderful to be back. It is wonderful to be back. It's interesting, I just spoke over at the Senate and after all of the time that I have spent in this building, that was the first time I'd ever been on the Senate floor. <laughs> I've been here a lot because my father served for 24 years, pretty close to where adult, uh, Representative Banks is sitting. My father was over right there in that area for a long time and I had the opportunity to come over here and spend time, stand, uh, be up in the gal gallery. I wasn't down here a lot, but I do represent a lot. I recognize a lot of the folks here that served with my father or in the intervening years the work that I've been able to do with the state legislature on water issues and different things. It's wonderful to be back in Wyoming. As you probably saw a couple of weeks ago we had a, a real challenge in terms of electing our Speaker of the House and I know that some people looked at that and thought that maybe that seemed to be a bit messy and that we needed to just get it done and that there were that was not the appropriate way to handle things and I disagree. I disagree vehemently. I felt that those were four days that were very well spent, number one, for all of us to get to know each other while we were back there, but also to debate the issues that are, in, that are critically important to the United States of America and to the state of Wyoming as well. Debate is healthy. Discussion is healthy. It's okay for us to have disagreements on how we're going to move forward on addressing some of the challenges that we face. But in doing that, um, as you probably saw or knew, I supported uh, leader, uh, Speaker McCarthy on all 15 votes. And I did that because of many of the concessions that he had made even before January 3rd, concessions on rule changes that I thought were extremely important. I also felt that it was very, very important that Wyoming, with only one, con one lone congressional representative, that we make sure that I'm, that I make sure that I'm doing whatever I can so that I can be the most effective for the state of Wyoming. And so those were some of just some of the reasons as to why I felt it was appropriate to support uh, spe uh, Speaker McCarthy. But something else that was important was that I recognized that as long as negotiations were going on, we were going to be making progress on changing the rules. And some of the rule changes were very, very important to actually getting us back to regular order. Some of those rule changes include that there will be a guaranteed minimum of 72 hours to review legislation before voting on it. So many of you think, well, that's just common sense. But you saw, you saw what happened with the omnibus spending bill from December. They spent $1.8 trillion and nobody got to read it. 4,000 pages, it's a monstrosity. And we do, not want to be, we do not want to be funding our government through omnibus spending bills. There will be no more proxy voting and we're no longer going to have remote committee meetings. If you wanna be in Congress, you better show up and do your job. We are also going to be doing only single subject bills and we have 10 that we have, we've already launched several right now. They're easy to understand, they make sense, they're common sense, we're pushing them forward already. We did, uh, we got more conservative members added to the rules committee. We also have the motion to vacate the chair that was uh, done away with under, well, after John Boehner. We have an open amendment process. I wasn't aware of this, and maybe many of you were not aware either, but they did not allow amendments on the floor since John Boehner was the Speaker of the House. The rules have become so much more restrictive that there were only about four or five people in the House that were actually making all of the decisions about the bills, and none of the other representatives really had a voice. We've changed that. We're not going to allow debt increases, debt limit increases without fiscal reforms, and we're going back to regular order in terms of our budgeting with putting forth 12 appropriation bills so that we can block any effort to do omnibus spending bills like we saw in December. This week I was informed that I have been appointed to the Judiciary Committee and I also will be on the Natural Resource Committee and throughout, yes. 
I am looking forward to both. I'm looking forward to serving on both, obviously being a trial attorney for almost 34 years, judiciary fits well in my natural resources and water background. I'm looking forward to working on both committees. Which brings me to two other things that we did uh, that were extremely important and that had been agreed to prior to January 3rd, and that was we have created two select subcommittees. The what, what sub, uh, set, select subcommittee is on the strategic competition between the United States and the Chinese Communist Party. We're going to investigate what is going on with China. We're going to be looking at it from the standpoint of all of the social media issues, the spying issues, as well as the theft of our, uh, of our manufacturing processes and all of those things. So there will be a subcommittee addressed specifically to the China threat that we face. But the other one that I'm, I have actually put my name in for, and it will be under the auspices or under the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee, and it is a su select subcommittee on the weaponization of the federal government. We've all seen over the last couple of years about what, what has happened with the FBI, with the NIH, with the, what happened with COVID. Um, we know from the lawsuit and the disclosure of documents, the lawsuit filed by Arkansas and uh, Louisiana and the disclosure of, of Fauci and his working with Twitter and the social media companies to not only uh, pro prohibit us from getting information, but also blocking free speech. So I am looking forward to working on that. We've also uh, take, taken several votes this week. Uh, this past week, we voted to rescind the repeal, the funding for the 87,000 IRS agents. That was the very first bill we voted on. We also voted on protecting Americans' strategic petroleum, re petroleum reserve from China. I don't know how many of you knew, but so much of the SPR that we have been draining uh, over the last six or eight months, a lot of that has gone to China. And we have now passed a bi bipartisan bill. I think it was 300 and some to 70 um, to block uh, selling SPR oil strategic petroleum reserve oil to the country of China. I've also been busy both sponsoring and co-sponsoring bills. I am a co-sponsor on the RAINS Act, on the Permitting for Mining Needs Act, on the VA Same Day Scheduling Act to ensure that our veterans are able to access medical care, the Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act, the Border Safety and Security Act. I also have signed on to a constitutional amendment to keep our Supreme Court justices at nine and also we've done a bill terminating the COVID-19 national emergency. And we've also two bills last week which would prevent the Biden administration from banning gas stoves as part of its radical climate change agenda. So those have all gone in. We also passed a bill, the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act, and we passed a resolution, yes. And we passed a resolution expressing the sense of Congress condemning the recent attacks on pro-life facilities, groups, and churches. So we've gone right to work. But I will tell you one of the things that I have to talk to you about was a meeting that we had with a gentleman from the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget last week, talking about the fiscal situation of our country. And I'm gonna tell you it's not looking good. We are at almost $32 trillion in debt. We are the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. Um, it, within a very short period of time, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and interest on the debt will be almost all, will take almost all of the federal budget. We're headed for a fiscal cliff, and with inflation, rising uh, gas and oil prices, the other f challenges that we are facing, it is not going to get any better unless we make some dramatic, dramatic changes in the way that we do business back in Washington, D.C. I'm telling you this because I'm very proud of the fact that I come from the state of Wyoming, that I come from, that I am represented by folks like you who understand your fiscal responsibilities, that you are responsible in terms of your budgeting, that you recognize that we have to live within our means, that you understand that you cannot have the kind of debt that we have in this country and survive as a nation. Near the end of the gentleman's presentation to us, I asked one question. And I said, at any time in world history, are you aware of any other countries who faced the fiscal crisis that we do? 
And he said, well, it's very interesting. That's a good question. He said before he went to OMB, he was an, a world history economics professor, and I believe it was at Princeton. And he said, there are other countries who have faced a similar fiscal cliff like what we're facing. But he said, the, those countries that did not make the difficult decisions have never and will never recover. Argentina, Greece, and others. And I said, but are there countries that made the right decisions? And he said, I can think of two, and that's Israel and Canada. But he said, Canada had the help of the American dollar. And as far as Israel, they had to make some extremely difficult decisions, and it wasn't easy. But they were able to turn their economy around. And that's a very important lesson for all of us, and especially for those like me who are serving in Congress. We don't have much time. We don't have much time to get control of this. Soon after I met with him, I had an opportunity to visit with, Mike, uh, with uh, Vice President Mike Pence, and I was telling him this story. And he said, well, there's one other country that has survived this kind of a fiscal cliff. He said it was New Zealand. And I said, how did they do it? And he said, they cut everything. They cut everything. And it was the only way that they were able to turn their economy around, and they're now the strongest economy in that part of the world. Why I'm telling you this is because we're going to have to make extremely difficult decisions in Washington, D.C. But for Wyoming, you have the ability to be self-sufficient. We need to fight for, we need to protect our legacy industries. We need to fight for and protect coal, oil and gas, our agricultural industries. We not only provide the energy for this, for this state and this country, but we can do so for the world. And we can make sure that our economy is strong. We can protect not only Wyoming, but the United States of America. But it is important that you recognize that Wyoming needs to stand alone and be independent. We need to make sure that we're handling our own fiscal situation here because the federal government isn't gonna be there to bail us out. With that, I want you to know that I'm very optimistic because there are a lot of good people in Congress that I have been able to meet over the last couple of weeks who all have the same understanding that I do and many of you in this room have, which is we're going to have to change the way that we do business. We're going to have to change what's happening in Washington, D.C. My agenda is to take power and authority away from unelected bureaucrats and force Congress to make the difficult decisions. But we're also going to have to get our fiscal house in order. I talk about Wyoming a lot. I talk talk about what we do here and how we can be a model for the rest of the country. I truly believe that. I truly believe in your leadership, what you do. I'm very proud of all of you, and I'm very proud to come from the great state of Wyoming. So thank you. On behalf of the Wyoming Legislature, we thank you for your service to Wyoming in the United States House of Representatives. Continuing Committee of the Whole, first bill for consideration, House Bill 7. House Bill 7, sponsored by Zawanitzer Dan. Underage Marriage Amendments, an act relating to domestic relations. Mr. Speaker, your committee number three revenue, to whom was referred House Bill 7, Underage Marriage Amendments, respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, Representatives Byron, Harshman, Northrop, Oakley, Storer, Zwanitzer. Noes, 
Representatives Baer, Locke, Strzok. Representative Harshman, Chairman. You've heard the reading of the bill. What's your pleasure, Chairman Harshman? Members, I apologize, Mr. Chairman. Chair, Chair, Chairman Harshman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd move that when the committee whole rise and report, I'd do so with the favorable recommendation on House Bill 7, and I'd turn the, uh, the explanation over to the sponsor, the good representative from, from uh, our capital city. Representative Zwana, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to present House Bill 7 uh, this afternoon. This is the Underage Marriage Amendments Bill. Wyoming is uh, one of eight states left in the country that don't have a minimum age set to marry. Um, for those of you constitutional people, right, marriage is actually a right reserved completely to the states. So each state gets to set their own marriage uh, sideboards, including the minimum age to marry. So as I said, Wyoming is one of eight states left that has no minimum age to marry. We do have some recommendations in our current statute that it be 16 um, with caveats that if a judge or a county clerk allow, um, we can marry someone under that age of 16. So what the bill does um, is sets the absolute minimum age to be married in Wyoming at 16. It's preferred to be 18, but there are some provisions because we have some other provisions in our laws when it comes to homeless youth, when it comes to emancipation, that we do allow um, minors, in those cases, 16 and 17 year olds, to do what we call contract, right? Uh, be liable and, and sign documents that have the force of law. That is basically the bill, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you can read through it that there are some provisions that if you are a 16 or 17 year old who does want to get married, you need parental consent, uh, either written or in appearance. And if that does not happen, um, the judge in uh, that case could step in and still authorize under certain provisions. But I do think it's important that we take a strong stand um, on this. We do have a minimum age uh, from our uh, Office of Vital Records. We do have roughly 20 uh, minors per year in Wyoming under the age of 18 um, contract of marriage. So I do think it's important we at least have a minimum age in our statutes. Be happy to answer any questions. Is there any discussion? Representative Jennings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How many under the age of 16? Representative Zwana, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The office doesn't keep track of that information per se, um, but they did know of at least two 14-year-olds in the last decade um, who have contracted a marriage in Wyoming that they were aware of. But otherwise, they just keep the vital statistics um, that two, that about 20 per year, this is an average of 10-year running average that equates to about 20 per year under the age of 18. Representative Ward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just have a question. Uh, from my research, it indicates that the age of consent is 17 in Wyoming. I'm just wondering how this interplays with this bill. Thank you. Representative Olson. Chairman Olson. No? Thank you. Um, Representative. Representative Zwan, sir. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. To answer that question, and, and let me first say there's several national groups who are pushing for the minimum age of marriage to be 18 um, without any exceptions whatsoever. As many of you know, Wyoming has a higher rate of teenage pregnancy than, than many other um, states. And so I do think it's important, even though I have had some pushback um, from, you know, various sides that you should have no marriages at 16 or 17. I do think there are cases in Wyoming where 
um, especially if a pregnancy does occur at 17 or even 16. And, and that union, um, I think it's great to be involved in a, in a contract into a marriage. I think that's the right thing to do. So even though I have had some pressure about setting that age at 18, I do think with just knowing knowing how kids are these days, um, that we have uh, that allowability and flexibility for 16 or 17 year olds. Representative Locke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to uh, throw out a few thoughts here just to make sure we have the full spectrum of thoughts here on it. Um, of course, we all want to ensure that we have the right protections for our for our young children and our and our kids, our 17, our 16, 17 year old children. Of course, we want that. Um, <clears throat> there, there's no question. The, the the part I want to throw out here is that we've got to keep in mind, and I ask the body to keep in mind that there is a wide range of beliefs here, all the way from the beliefs in in the family beliefs and us ensuring that we leave power with the family where it belongs, as well as many religious beliefs that vary from from that. It, it may not even be consistent with what we personally believe, but we certainly have to take into consideration those are out there, and we want to make sure we are very careful to encroach on those beliefs. I want to at least put that out there. And, and then, then the last thing is just, rather than thinking we're the, we're the people who can make this kind of decision, I think we should be very cautious and only have, keep in mind that we should have the minimum the minimum necessary government involvement in this kind of kind of issue, uh, certainly in the case of the family's decision. Thank you. Representative Oakley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so obviously, it's a, sort of a policy choice. I think when you when you look at our laws as a whole, it's replete with all sorts of uh, recognition of, of, of the, the tender age, if you will. Um, minors of, of the age we're talking about, 15 and under, cannot contract, uh, cannot consent to have sex. Um, we have, in fact, it's, it's, it's 10, 15, 20 year felonies to have sex with, uh, with children of this age. I mean. So this is something we recognize, uh, we recognize in all sorts of ways that children of this age are not able to, to make an informed consent on, on, on these decisions. Um, as far as religious beliefs, there's also all sorts of things that we have in our law uh, that we preclude. Polygamy uh, is, not, um, is something that, that some uh, religions, uh, even in this state, practice, but it is not something that is statutorily um, allowed. So the reality is the world changes. Uh, most everything is 18 as a, as a minimum for people to be considered an adult, to be making choices like this. You have to be 16 to drive. Um, when, when you really look at it, this, this, isn't, a, this isn't really a stretch at all. Um, and, and there's a reason that we're one of only eight states that don't have anything on the books. So, I mean, we have had, I think we, I read something about an 11 year old getting married. Um, that was in Kentucky. So sorry, in a different state. Um, but, uh, so, so sometimes status quo, uh, isn't, doesn't really reflect society. Um, I think that this is a legal change that makes sense that recognizes minors for for where they are in their development and i think it fits in with all sorts of other types of laws um, that we have so I, I i personally don't think of this as some some large stretch or some big change um, i just think it like i said it fits our laws and it fits where um, 15 and younger children should be in their in their lives quite honestly so with that i would ask for your i vote representative rodriguez williams thank you mr chairman uh speaking in in opposition of the bill a question for the bringer of the bill just curious if there was any consideration for some of the um larger groups in our uh state such as the mennonites or the amish 
Chairman Washit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Question for the bringer. Uh, on the date of these, these uh, young people getting married, do we know how old the spouse is? Uh, not, not just how old the minor was, but, but what's the age differential between the person? Who are they marrying? Are they marrying 55-year-olds or are they marrying other teenagers? Representative Slegel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I come before you uh, on and against this bill. And uh, my, my reason is uh, from state statute 12-2-206, states' parental rights are a fundamental right to the care and custody and control of their children. This is a parental rights issue, and I think we should just follow our statute and let the parents make the decision. I mean, there's lots of different things, as I mentioned before, with different groups of uh, that have different beliefs than many of us do in this this community in this state. And I think this is ultimately a parental rights issue, and I think it needs to stay at that. Thank you, Chairman Zwanser. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I mean, I appreciate parental rights as much as anyone, but I don't think parents should be allowed to marry off their kids in some cases. And so where this is found in the statutes, it's 21106, and it's who can solemnize a marriage. And so I'll just read it for the floor, because um, this does talk about religion. Every district or circuit court judge, district court commissioner, Supreme Court justice, magistrate, and every licensed or ordained minister of the gospel, bishop, priest, rabbi, or other, or other qualified person acting in accordance with the traditions or rights for the solemnization of marriage of any religion, denomination, or religious society can perform a marriage in the state. And so, you know, I mean, I think we do respect religion in our statutes currently, but that's where um, some of this danger occurs right? We don't have a minimum age for marriage in the state. And we allow um, people to perform marriages as long as it, you know, conforms to the denomination, religious society um, of their religion. That should worry us in some cases, right? I mean, I'm all for understanding there's all sorts of interesting consequences, but I do believe it's important for this body to set a floor that you can't marry someone less than 16. And as I said, this is a kind of nationwide effort. Many states um, the last 10 years are pursuing, ensuring they have this minimum age. And Wyoming does not want to be the, you know, the last state left standing, right? We, that's not a, an attraction where we want people to move to our state so they can marry children. And so there is some kind of, uh, I guess, um, what's the word I'm looking for? some immediacy to getting a minimum marriage age in place because right now you know the only other state in, in our area is california so we don't want to be the last one and having people coming to the state to marry children would be my fear representative strock did i get it on oh thank you um mr chairman and uh, the first thing, I did vote no on this. My big thing is every time we seem to meet down here, we seem to take away our freedoms and our rights. It doesn't matter what it is. And that was one of them. And then it is, um, we do have the parents will say if they can get married. And then my number third one, um, I just feel if these kids are bent on being together or marrying, they're gonna be living together anyway. And whose right is it to say they can't be together? And that was, thank you. Chairman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'm trying to think of a, a situation in which this is truly applicable and it's not just a um, hypothetical. And, and then I'm trying to take it down the steps of what could happen, right? And, I, and I'm literally trying to figure out, number one, I've heard religious liberties, and then I've heard uh, parental rights. And so I, I, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. First one is, is I, I personally would like to know um, at what point a religion or what religion says we want to allow our children at 15, 14, 13, 12 years old to get married. Um, I'd like to know that, first of all. I, I'm not aware of that, but I'm, I'm certainly just standing here saying, please inform me. But number two, I, I'm taking this down a road. So let's say a 14, 15, even 16-year-old decides to get married. 
and they go to their parents and we say that this is a parental rights issue and the parents say this is okay. They sign off on this, they say it's okay, but the other person is, let's say 22, 23. We go down six months down the road after the marriage, and somewhere along that line, the, the individual claims rape has occurred. And so then they file for divorce, and they come back, and they say, well, hey, I was raped. In that situation, we now have a minor that is contesting rape against a spouse, which is already tough to prove. But then we also take it the next step and the fact that this was a parental rights issue. So is the parent now liable for allowing that to occur to their minor? And, and I'm, these are liter legitimate questions that we have to tackle here. And I, I think it's something that we need to consider. If we're gonna look at parental rights, we gotta look at both sides here. And if you sign off your, your, your rights and say, okay, well this, this individual is 16 and they know what they want to do. And yep, I, I'm signing off on this. And something treacherous happens to this individual as a minor. Are we going to carry that liability over to the parent as well for signing off those parental rights and saying that I entrusted this individual because you're, you're basically just saying that's an adoption at some point. So I, I'm not sure that this is the greatest bill ever. I honestly don't know exactly where I stand on it, but if I could get a little bit of help with those two questions, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Representative Storer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to answer the question about um, uh, are these, uh, you know, Romeo and Juliet marriages, uh, national figures cite that 86% uh, of minority w uh, marriages are to adults. So just think about what that means. Um, I do think, you know, we obviously uphold religious freedom and parental rights in Wyoming, but at some point, actions such as this cross the line to child abuse. And when you look at the statistics for what happens, especially to these young girls when they marry young, I think you all have to pause and think about, is this something we should allow? Most, almost 80% end up in divorce. Most, three times more likely to be sexually abused. More likely to drop out of high school. More likely not to complete college. More likely to have long-term health risks, as well as sexually transmitted infections. And more likely, to die in childbirth under the age of 20. So I do think we really need to think about standing up for these young girls and recognizing that at some point we just say no to allowing young girls who do not have are who are not of the age of consent to be abused in such a manner. Thank you. Representative Pendergraf. Mr. Chairman, I want to ask a question of the body. And I, before I do that, I want to point out, we could stand here and we could debate this forever. And I doubt we're going to change a single mind in this body. So I would encourage us to move on. But I do want to ask this question. Who invented marriage? Does, does marriage pre-exist this body, this government? God invented marriage. It is a contract between a man and a woman and their God. The state has come in and decided that people who have entered into that contract maybe get some benefits or whatever as, as a way of shaping society. And we can argue the relative merits of that. But as far as I'm concerned, where I come from, marriage is a contract between a man, a woman, and God. And we don't have the right to tell anybody what they can do in that regard. Thank you. Representative Oakley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so a couple things I want to address, uh, I think a representative several times ago, 
um, asked about the age of, you know, so if you're talking about the minor, like you say right now, let's say 14 year old. Um, so obviously this law is in relation to them. So there is no upper limit. And of course, some of some of the situations we see, the the probably usually the male wouldn't have to be, but is significantly older. Um, but in the end, that's not. I mean, there you know, there's no you can marry somebody five years with you know if they're within five years of your age. That that's not part of this statute. So so there is no upper limit um, there. Uh, and then so the good representative from District Nine asked some questions, to be honest, um, not sure I completely followed, um, but talking about like parental liability, unless you're talking about suing your parents, I guess, which you could do, um, there isn't, you know, if, if they contracted you, allowed you to get married, I guess, and, and, then, um, and then you decided you didn't want to, I guess you could sue them. There's not a criminal liability per se. Um, but that does bring up talking about liability, what I'm still interested in, and I don't know how this plays out because, again, it, it currently is allowed, but, um, you know, everybody recognizes the term statutory rape. Well, the statutory part of that, what that means is it's a per se crime. So there's no intent, it's just the act of having sex. So, so again, it's illegal to, to, to have sex with 15-year-old. There's, there's a whole different... You know, four years older. If you're 16, you know, there's a there's a structure which I won't go into. But um, I don't know how that plays uh, into this in the in the example that was used. Let's say a minor, you know, a 15 year old girl got married and then decided, no, you know, that I, it seems like technically they could be prosecuted for statutory rape. But um, I can't, I guess, necessarily clear all that up. But it is a bit messy. And then finally, um, to the last speaker. Uh, you know, and obviously there is sort of this religious component to this, and it was said that God created marriage, um, and 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 I think a lot of people with religious beliefs uh, hold that to be true. Well, then, then, then all of those religions can um, can I guess practice as they see fit. Uh, we are talking. We are the government as we sit here. We are talking about government sanctioned marriage. That's what, that's what we're referring to. Um, this is a contract. It goes through the courts. So people can choose to practice how they want, uh, but we sitting here as a government can say that we are not going to give you a governmental license to marry a child. Um, and that's what we're discussing here. Representative Crago. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To be honest with you, I'm not sure where I'm going to end up on this, so I'm enjoying the debate. I think there's some good discussion going back and forth, but I actually just have a question for the bringer of the bill. And it has to do with uh, statute number 141102, which is the right to contract, which actually talks about how old you have to be to enter into a valid contract, which is an overlay on this discussion we're having. And in that particular contract, it actually talks about the age of 16 um, and the requirements of a 16 year old being able to roll into a contract and my only I guess number my question for the bringer of the bill is how does that did you look at that was that part of your discussion or decision in bring in setting that age maybe and then two how do you think it actually affects your your bill thank you Mr. Chairman Chairman Zwanser uh, thank you Mr. Chairman I'm not sure if the good uh, Representative knew that was a softball question because six years ago I was the one who brought the bill on homeless minors to the body that allowed 16 year olds in line um, in Title 14 to set that floor to be able to be um, under certain circumstances emancipated under certain provisions from their parents or get out of a difficult um, familial situation and that's why we have um, I don't think I can say the name but we have a, a nonprofit now dedicated to helping um, minors who are homeless um, be able to still finish school and and provide them services and access so yes um, it was very specific as i may have mentioned before this is or at least was in the last five years a very large nationwide effort to set the floor age at 18 and based on um, where i know wyoming laws are and, and wyoming people um, 
As I said, I got some significant pushback for not setting it at 18, but in accordance with all of our other laws, and I did have LSO go research um, various statutes that I knew existed in relation to the same legal age, um, I did think 16 was the correct floor uh, to set the bill at. And that's why under provisions, you can still be married at 16 and 17. Chairman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, so I, I wanna just rephrase my question for the body because I, I think where I was going was not quite exactly how it was taken. And it took me that long walk back from the front to the back here to figure out that I was actually talking about child endangerment and could a parent be held um, liable for child endangerment. And, and so I was able to pull up uh, 64403, which says no par parent or guardian or custodian of a child shall knowingly or with criminal negligence cause permit or contribute to the endangering of the child's life or health by violating a duty of care protection or support. And so I might, my thought is, could a prosecutor, my question is, could a prosecutor bring charges against a parent if they married, if they allowed their 14 year old, we'll just say daughter, 14 year old daughter to a 23 year old man? Could they be charged in criminal court for violating their, their duties as a parent for child endangerment? And especially if there was something to do with a sexually transmitted disease, for instance. Um, you know, I, I guess I'm just trying to figure out if 14 years old, 15 years old, and we just sign this off and we, we don't put a cap on this, we don't put a floor on this, sorry, not a cap. We don't put a floor on this. What are we ultimately doing and could a parent be held liable if we don't fix this? Representative Ottman. Thank you, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, I guess. Um, I just wanna bring a thought to that. Um, I believe that we all are here to make uh, our communities and our families and our state and our world better. And that's, that's a good thing. But there's certain things that there has to be personal responsibility and accountability and decision making. And when we look at it, people, some, some people are very immature at 16. Some people are very immature at 30. But when we're, when we're looking at different things like that, um, a person can drive at the age of 16, a person can quit school at the age of 16 um, or 10th grade, a person can do a lot of things at the age of 16, a person can work at 16, a person can uh, be independent. Um, from their parents. So I, I'm just wondering if, if we need to do anything with this. Is it our business? Thank you. Chairman Zwanser. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, apparently among the attorneys in the back, it's an interesting legal question um, that the good representative from District 9 brought up. I think the prevailing belief right now when we're gonna go do some more research is that when you get married, it basically is an automatic that you are emancipated and no longer a child um, would be how we are currently thinking um, those statutes would intertwine. But again, it's an interesting area. And as I think you all know, body, when you think of these difficult situations, um, these aren't the people who come forward until decades later saying I was a child bride. Um, you know, they're in difficult, stressful, um, coercive, toxic relationships with an older person. They get married off to them. You know, you can't go hire a divorce, a divorce lawyer at 15. You don't have any money. You don't have any other means, right? You're kind of controlled by your spouse. And so that's really what um, we're setting out to protect, right? I certainly don't want to in interfere with anyone's religious customs or rights or traditions. But I do think in America in 2022, we should have a statement that says you can't marry a child, at least under the age of 16. I don't think that's too far of a step in today's day and age. Representative Locke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, just one last thought on this because I think it's real easy to uh, <clears throat> impose our beliefs on everybody else in this room. And the truth is we all have a different perspective on what's the right age. And, and I would be remiss if I, if I told you guys I didn't think there was a, a floor. I certainly do have an opinion of that. So I can't sit here and tell you I don't. <clears throat> so my argument against this is from this perspective. It's just 
where and how deeply does the government get involved in this process? Knowing full well that, first of all, everybody in this room has a different perspective than me, and certainly so do many groups across our state, and we need to protect that and help them preserve their beliefs as well. Thank you. Representative Provenza. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I appreciate that the last speaker mentioned the role of government. The role of government, at least in my opinion, maybe we have some different ideas about that, but the role of government in part is to protect the people, to make sure that we are creating a society or our laws reflect that society. Um, and so my question is if, a, if the majority or what we heard from some information earlier from uh, the good representative from Teton County that a large number of these cases end up problematic or perhaps dangerous, then isn't it the role of the government to step in and say, we, we have to take care, we have to take care of what is considered a problem. Um, I, I believe that the role of government is in that case responsible in terms of are we going what are we going to allow? Um, the other issue that I'm struggling to get a hold of because I'm hearing words while I'm talking words, so <laughs> my apologies there. Um, oh, I guess if, you know, one, one point that another good representative made was that um, God and whoever you deem as God determines your relationship as marriage, that it's not necessarily up to the government, which I can appreciate. Um, so if that's the case, then why are we concerned what the government says is or isn't marriage if it gets to be between you and your church and your community and your relationship with God and your spouse? Um, is it really an infringement if it can exist without the state? So I, I, I would pose those questions. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Angelos. Mr. Chair. Um, I think there's some really good debate on this subject. I think we all have the same goal of wanting to protect children. I, I can totally see that. The thing that I have a concern with that I'm starting to see is we've seen the age to smoke and drink be moved back from 18 to 21. So who's to say that we can't move this up from 16, 17, now we're at 19, now we're at 21. I was young when I got married. I was just barely 19, my husband was 18. We've been married 23 years, but who's to say that this just, just doesn't just get moved up and moved up? That's what I wanted to make a comment about. Thank you. Representative Oakley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so a, a couple of points. Uh, uh, a good representative from my county um, was discussing that at the age of 16 you can drive you can work um, i agree and to keep in mind this bill only says void and prohibited under 16. so there is a permissive way at 16 and 17. Um, because again we, we we note the difference in again throughout our law as as people age there's differences between 14 15 16 all the way through 21. Um, and so it's not it's not void or prohibited unless 15 or younger. Um, there was discussion on not wanting to impose beliefs, and, and I know that's clearly a part of this discussion, but I think it's important to keep in mind that what this is based on isn't just some, isn't, you know, just beliefs. These, this, this is based on very real characteristics of the ability and the development of children um, that, again, we recognize in a lot of places in the law. Um, oh, and then I guess finally the last one is, uh, I, I'll, I'll just put to the body that I, I think it's an irrelevant comment that about what a future body will do about the law. That's, we're not here to, to discuss what the 68th or the 69th legislature uh, is going to do. We are the 67th, we are looking at this law. This is about a 15 year old or younger, 10, 11, 12, it happens. Um, I don't think it's something that we should allow in our state. Um, so this is the this is the policy that we're we're looking at and debating on this this floor today. So, with that, I think I'm about done. So I ask for your I vote.
Representative Jennings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just wanna point out a couple of things. Uh, if we use the statistics, and I'm not saying that I agree with this, those particular statistics, statistics have a way of uh, being manipulated for sure. But representative republic, we have to look out, and this is for, for the minority also. And so I'm, I see this as a very difficult issue to tackle. If we'd use that statistic, 17 marriages would go bad. Then what about, will we inhibit the happiness of the other three? I don't know. And then the other part that I want us to think about is the state has been brought up a lot here. And the state has done very well. We've done sex education, we've done alcohol, we've done drugs. And to be honest with you, I, I'm not sure the state always gets that figured out quite right. We haven't really won the war on drugs. We're here debating a bill that would have to do with marriage. And a lot of times the state has been, uh, had their finger in all of these issues. Seems to me like that the, the family might be the better place to arbitrate this and not to have a heavy hand of the state. Listen, I wish we could roll back time and maybe have kept the state out of marriage, but we didn't. And so now we get to here, come here and we get to make decisions. And I think about those families. They're already in a struggling issue if they, uh, this is, question has come up. All of our families have probably had children that married a little too early, struggled. Sometimes they make it, sometimes they don't. The more important thing is that they have love and support from the, that family or their faith, people around them, rather than to have the heavy hand of the state step in and say, you can't do this. They probably are doing that because Maybe their emotions got away from them. It's not, a, it's not an easy situation here. I just, uh, I would recommend a no on this because the state's not the one that provides the answers to every solution, every problem in life. Representative Zwanis, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, we, we need to bring this to a close. So here's what the issue is. If you do not believe the government should be involved in setting the age of when a young lady should get married, then vote no on this bill. If you believe the government has a role to serve and protect you, then you should be voting yes. And then bring a second amendment reading tomorrow and let's talk about the age at that point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Yen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do want to bring up one subject that I, I haven't heard about, which is actually child sex trafficking. So there is a situation where children can be trafficked into the state, they can be married, and then use that as a justification to keep them as citizens, but then they're locked into a marriage where they can't get out of it because one, they're a child, um, and two, they, they, have, they have power over them by a, a larger adult because Again, they're a child and they don't know what they can do to exercise those rights to get out of it. So I, I do worry that, that by saying no to this bill, we, we're saying that that kind of marriage is okay. And I, I think that's a bad message to send. So I, I do want everyone to keep that in their mind as a concern. Question being called. <clears throat> those in favor of Chairman Harshman's motion when the Committee of the Whole rises to report and do so with recommendation that House Bill 7 do pass. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. No. The chair is undecided. <clears throat> Standing division. Ayes please stand. Please everybody stand still, don't move around, they're trying to count you. And stay within the bar.
All the no's, please stand up. Thirty six twenty seven. House Bill 7 passes. Committee of the whole. Uh, the next bill for consideration is House Bill 33. Mr. Mr. Oh, Chairman. Um, I apologize. I apologize. Chairman, Chairman Olson, privilege of the floor. Privilege of the floor. Privilege of the floor. All right. As many of you may know or um, are learning now that our schools closed down um, early today because of the snowstorm, uh, which is a blessing and a curse when you're a parent. But it is a blessing for me today because I have up in the gallery up here uh, the privilege of introducing my 11-year-old, Eden Faith, behind the... Go ahead and stand up, Eden. Yep, so she's here. She's here. This is school now. She's here. She's here with mom. And... Hiding behind that pillar, you can see him peering over now. That's Abel Solomon. He's my youngest. And then there's mom, the first lady of House District 11. Thank you, Chairman Olson. Will committee of the whole please come to order? The next bill for consideration is House Bill 33. Will the reading clerk please read the bill? House Bill 33, sponsored by Education, School Finance, Career Technical Education Grants, an act relating to school finance. Mr. Speaker, your committee number four, Education to Whom's Referred House Bill 33, School Finance, Career Technical Education Grants, respectfully report same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, Representatives Allred, Berger, Brown, Clauston, Lawley, Obermuller, Provenza. Excused, Representatives Andrew and Northrup. Representative Obermuller, Vice Chairman. This bill was re-referred to Committee Number Two Appropriations. To whom, your committee, Mr. Speaker, your Committee Number Two Appropriations to whom was referred House Bill 33, School Finance Career Technical Educational Grants. Respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. Eyes, Representatives Henderson, Larson, Nicholas, Sherwood, Stith, Walters, so on and so forth. Representative Nicholas, Chairman. You've heard the reading of the bill. What is your pleasure, Chairman Nicholas? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move in the committee of whole, rise and report. It does so with a recommendation that a House Bill 33 do pass. I'll tell, turn the explanation over to the good chairman of education. Vice Chair Obermuller. Chairman Northrup. Chairman Northrup, apologize. There you go, you're good. All right, I'm gonna explain this bill first. First off, I'd just like to say this is to incentivize school districts to provide more CTE programs. It allows them to apply for CTE grants if they're expended all their CTE dollars. So all during the summer and all for the last year, all I've heard is CTE, CTE. We need more electricians, we need more plumbers, we need more people that can pound nails. We need anything to get some of this construction done. You just can't find labor to get it done. And so this bill will incentivize kids that are in school to get a chance to get involved in CTE. I mean, the choices are, do you get them involved in CTE or do you get them involved in watching something on a screen? So more screen time, CTE. That's kind of the way I view this right now. So we're, this bill will give $50,000 grants up to $50,000 grants for school districts that have expended all their money in CTE. So therefore they've got a program that's working really good, whether it's woodworking or welding or construction trade. And they're trying to get this program maybe more advanced. Maybe we need, instead of having a TIG and a um, uh, I'm sorry, maybe having a MIG and an arc welder, we need to have a TIG, which is a tungsten inert gas welder, so that we can weld aluminum. 
all these things are out there for these kids. We just got to get them involved in it and get them shown what's going on. Um, so at any rate, that's what this is for, is to give some money for these districts to get them involved in the CTE. It's a one-time deal and they have to spend all their money. And that pretty much touches on all the high points. I'll stand for questions. Chairman Northwood, <coughs> Northrup, do we have um, someone to move the, the amendment? The amendment's the committee of the whole amendment. It ha will have to be moved by the bringer. Let's do questions on the bill. Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to move my amendment, committee of the whole number one. So moved. Thank you. The amendment I brought is I always feel like everyone should have skin in the game. Um, so the amendment I put in is a 10% match from schools. So if a school wants a $5,000 grant, they have to put that into the education. But I want the school districts to put in then 10% or say $500. Uh, I want them to make the effort that's just something that they really want and that they really need. So that's why I put this amendment on. Thank you. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Um, I'd just like to say, Mr. Chairman, excuse me. Discussion on the amendment? Chairman Northrup. Thank you. I'd just like to say that, remember, they've expended all our CTE dollars in this to get into the whole process of getting this money so that they'll have to go back and find other money to put into that bit that they're going to be adding into. I just want to bring that up. Um, I think that it's possible. I think it's a good amendment. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Question being called. Um, question being called, all those in favor of standing committee amendment number one, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. Amendment carries. <clears throat> no, that's right. Yeah. Let's move to a discussion of the bill. We're back on the bill. Move to the discussion of the bill. Oh, Speaker Summers. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, this, this bill was worked in the education committee when I was on it. And really what we heard was there was a need for more CTE and there was a need for more ability to buy equipment. Um, we didn't want to just, uh, just do grants if you hadn't used your existing money. So the idea was once you use up that money, there'll be a little pot of money left. And I, we also heard the value of CTE. You know, we, we talk about it a lot, but I think as you know, these pathways are much different than they used to be with CTE. There's a multiple multitude of pathways in many schools, and it's become very important for kids in the long run to make a living and, and have good jobs. And so this is just uh, just trying to provide a little more CTE in the, down at the K-12 level while uh, ensuring that the money that they're currently using is being spent so we don't gobble it up into the black hole. So thank you. Representative Bear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a question for the bringers of the bill. Um, I just didn't notice any kind of a sunset on this grant program. Just curious if there's any kind of uh, end to the program or if this is perpetual. Thank you. Chairman Northrup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A school district, it's on the back page of the of fiscal note, says the school district receives funds under Wyoming statute for the CTE demonstration grant is NL to receive funds under this grant program for the period the district receives the funds. In other words, it's a two-year period. As far as this being re-upped, it's going to be part of the uh, state budget is right. Standard, sorry. Speaker Summers. So, Mr. Chairman, I was talking in the back, which is a terrible thing, but I'm going to answer that question anyway. It would roll into the, it would be ongoing expense, right? It's not it wouldn't necessarily go to each the same school each time, but it's an ongoing grant program. So the next budget, it would be part of the standard budget in Department of Education as a CTE grant program. 
Thank you. Representative Locke. Sorry, this is just for my own edification. So this question, in terms of this uh, this purchase, this uh, that that is being made here, is this is this somehow normally outside the normal budget for schools? If if I could just get some clarification on that, that would be helpful. Thank you, Speaker Summers. Mr. Chairman, thank you. So this is the outside of the block grant, and it would be a grant that is uh, basically a competitive grant by school districts. The WDE would oversee it, if I remember correctly, unless something happened, got changed in committee. And uh, so they would oversee it. They would, it would be a competitive grant where districts would submit to, to the uh, WDE. They would develop rules and regulations, and then those grants would go out accordingly. So not in the block grant. What we're trying to do is ensure that the that the uh, CTE money that is in the block grant is used up. So we're actually going to track that a little harder, make sure that is used up before they ever go after this money. So that's that's the idea. Representative Trujillo. I just have a quick question. Um, back in my high school days, these classes were really big in high school. And now that we're in today's time, we're asking for grant money to bring these back into the classroom. So my question is, where did the money go in the first place when it was taken out of the class? And can we get it back to where that money was put? Speaker Summers. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I'm not sure of any sp specific local issue. What I can tell you, as long as I've been in the legislature, within the funding model, the big block grant, there has been an, um, an item in there that is CTE. So it's always been a part of the system um, to provide a little extra funding for CTE. And, uh, and so I'm not sure what it means by outside or inside the classroom, but I can tell you that CTE funding has been in the block grant for as long as I've been here. Thank you. Representative Trujillo. Uh, to clarify what I mean by in the classroom and outside the classroom, um, my daughter is a current high school student now, and these classes aren't as funded and um, prevalent. So my question is again, why are they not pushed and as prevalent today as they've always been? And where has that money gone to push for the prevalence, I guess? Speaker Summers. Mr. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And frankly, that's the, the greatest advocacy for this bill you'll find. It's what's happened as time has gone on is school districts feeling, you know, they feel like they have the pinch. And so they've been, perhaps, perhaps they some of them have been robbing this pot to use somewhere else because it is in the block grant. So what we're saying here is you show us that you're using this money as we wanted it to be used for, and we're gonna provide a carrot that will provide a grant program that allow you to get a little more money for this CTE effort. So the idea is to ensure we get more of it back in schools like was it was intended. And I think what we also have to understand is the cost of, as we know, costs everywhere, costs of this equipment has gotten higher and higher, depending on the program, right? It all depends on what the program is, but some of these programs have really expensive equipment and they have to save money over time. So, you know, we're not, we're not saying you have to spend every dime every year because they squirrel money over time to then buy a big piece of equipment, but this will help them get that done as well. So the, the whole intent is to get back to the fact that we want more in the schools and, uh, and anyway, Thanks. Representative Penn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if the question is about trying to solve the issue of less students in CTE classrooms, I think we might be barking up the wrong tree. My husband is a CTE teacher, and so he deals with this all of the time. The issue that he experiences is not that kids aren't 
wanting to come to him necessarily, or the, it's a lack of equipment. The issue that he comes up to probably first and foremost is the fact that counselors are not funneling students to his classes. They're funneling students through a, a, the Hathaway Scholarship Program, which, which minimally involves the CTE teachers. And that's really the issue that, that, that um, the CTE teachers have, is that the counselors are not sending kids that way. They're sending the kids on a path to um, be prepared to accept a Hathaway Scholarship. Um, so also to comment on um, the way that they save up, because CT does have, they have big um, ticket items. There's tire machines and there's welders and there's all these things that have large price tags, you know, $30,000 for a, a auto lift, um, $40,000 for a plasma table. Um, the CTE teachers are, are pretty good at sharing um, those burdens and, and um, like was just mentioned, they kind of save up and say, okay, this year is your year for a big ticket item and this year is your year for a big ticket item. There are also other grants available, Perkins being one of them. It's a very common one and, and um, oftentimes um, high schools get tens of thousands of dollars from those grants every, every year. Representative Berger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your comments, uh, the good representative from, from Fremont County. Appreciate that. Uh, my experience with CTE, from I'll give you a personal one and a couple others, but my own son, who um, is also on the Hathaway path, uh, took classes that were um, uh, accredited from CTE teachers who taught concurrent enrollment, like animal science and uh, even welding and earned college credit. And that animal science was sufficient enough to uh, give him credit to go on to the uh, uh, Hathaway scholarship, because there were some other classes that he did not want to take as far as like biology, and he ended up with animal science and uh, they they allowed that. You all know my situation and the and the uh, the group of of students that I serve. Okay, in our community, all right, at our high school, we have a, a small we have a school ranch. We've been building that for the last I don't know eight years, and for the students I serve, we've partnered with that group and had a great time. We've had ranchers supply us with tractors we've had ranchers supply us with cows where my group come in all right we 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 did the feeding program we fed all the cows in the winter it helped with job skills uh all that we needed a new tractor and we we saved and saved and we bought a tractor and they helped us my students till up some ground so that we can make a big garden we would benefit from extra help from CTE money. It would be great. We've had many instances of tractors breaking down, balers, oh, we were using old balers and we were able to use our monies. We need just that little better extra help. We have a lot of people, a lot of kids going into CTE at our school. And, and because of that, we have really good um, CTE people who can teach what we call concurrent enrollment which help with that uh, uh, Hathaway track. And yes, in our district, our uh, counselors and our parents, myself, say, go to CTE because they can provide those concurrent enrollment classes, and it's great. And, and my son, he's, he'll tell you right now, oh, I'm so thankful that I had CTE and my teacher because he was so certified that I can get those credits that I needed to get the Hathaway scholarship. Thank you. Representative Allred. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Please bear with me a little bit. I hope I can express my feelings here. After 37 years in the educational system, I knew years and years ago that, and don't, and don't hold my numbers to me, okay, thanks. Um, 
40% of our high school graduates went to college, and, and I don't know how many of those even graduated. I knew a long time ago that the CTE program was the direction that we need to be teaching our kids. I also knew that it was going to cost a lot of money. As, as time went on, and as late as even 10 years ago, I saw from this capital the push for college. Our uh, admin team at the time uh, said to our CTE people, if you don't fill your classes, we're going to cut them. And so the emphasis was still toward college, and yet uh, I did check 10 years ago, and I think the numbers are still about the same, 40% graduate, and a whole lot less from high school, a whole lot less graduate from college. In the last 10 years, we have had a, a donor come and put a building up at our school. We are expanding CTE, and I am thrilled to see us going this direction, and as you've heard from others, the need is out there. We are educators. We are educators, and CTE is part of that education. Thank you. Representative Berger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, the chairman from uh, uh, Lincoln County, or the, the, the representative from think Lincoln County. I just want to make it clear as well. That experience that my son went through, and even my daughter, and all the kids that are experiencing in my district, I would like that to spread throughout this state. And this, I think, is a great opportunity that other communities could take advantage of to help grow their CTE programs. And we're great. Teachers are awesome. We beg, borrow, and steal. So if you need some ideas, come on over to Evanston. We'd be proud to share our ideas, even with me. I'm having, we're having a great time, and we're giving tons of credit, especially towards the Hathaway Scholarship Program. Thank you. Chairman Harshman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a couple of little for information. Uh, that the Hathaway, when we first wrote that and put it into existence, 2006 Merit Scholarship Committee, it did just have uh, foreign language. I mean, it's math, science, English. That's what the, it's trying to encourage kids to work hard in school because we know, you know, grades and learning and all that really is about the work. It's not, to, very few of us are geniuses, right? So most of us, like everything else in life, it's working at it. <clears throat> but that was changed. So now we allow, we don't require foreign language. We, re we require foreign language, fine and performing arts, or CTE. So those kids who are concentrators who want to be welders, they take four years of CTE and then take their ex basically uh, an extra math class is what we're talking about. They can get the full Hathaway. So that's, and that changed about four years ago. It was an important change when we were in the Jonas Center. And so that's out there. And then finally, I'll just say why we have this bill in front of us. Um, over the last 10 years, we've gone from a legislative model that funded education in excess of the consultant model, the constitutional model of 100 million. So we chose as a legislature to fund in excess of the model. And currently we're 100 million under the constitutional model. So it's just part of this thing. You had diminishing resources. We've gone through some very tough economic times. We did what we had to do and people are, you know, choices were made. And that was throughout all of government, not only the schools. So, and that's really, I think, why the speaker's bringing this bill to kind of give a little, little poof to that and, uh, and kind of reinvigorate. So thank you for the good debate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess a question maybe from somebody on the committee. Um, is this, is this the funding under this limited to supplies, equipment, et cetera? Are we gonna see any new positions created as a result of these grant programs? Chairman Northrup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On page four, top of page four, line one, it says, 
that this is limited to supplies, materials, and equipment for career and technical education programs utilizing the expenditure data from the immediate preceding five school years. So yes, not people, not anything else, but equipment and supplies. Thank you. Chairman Washer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Just if there's any confusion, you know, students may be being pushed towards Hathaway scholarship qualification, but that doesn't mean that they can't go into vocational fields at the community colleges. That Hathaway scholarship can be used towards a vocational certificate just like it can be for an academic degree at your community colleges. Well, Representative Ottman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a, a question, I guess, for clarification is with this, um, I am definitely for CTE and blue collar workers. That's been my family. Um, for a long time. But what I'm wondering is, um, we see with, um, I know a program at our local college that was very well funded and it's a wonderful program, but the people that are actually in that program are minuscule. And so what I was wondering is, where's the accountability piece? We also have um, a wonderful federal program that a past US Senator uh, brought to our county. It's wonderful, there's 30 openings and it's all oil field and welding and I mean, wonderful, wonderful programs. And um, it, they, they're not getting the students. So what I'm wondering is, where's the accountability piece and how's it going to be um, implemented? Thank you. Chairman Northrup. So as the good speaker spoke before, he said that all this is being accounted by the department is following it. It's in the bill they sh that they have to make sure that they've expended their money. They're making sure that all this money is being taken care of. Um, as far as accountability, it can either be money or personnel, and I'm trying to figure out which it is. But as far as the money goes, we're, the department will be following it, and we'll be making sure that it goes to CTE. <clears throat> Question being called. All those in favor of Chairman Northrop's motion that when the Committee of the Whole report, it does so with the recommendation that House Bill 33 do pass. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. <clears throat> the, the, the chair is unsure. Standing vote, Every, all those in favor, please stand. The, the chair's in doubt. All those in favor, please stand. All those opposed, please stand. Thirty-four I, twenty-six no. Bill, bill passes. Committee of the whole. House Bill thirty-three has passed. Committee of the whole. The next Mr. bill Speaker. up for consideration is House Bill forty-one. Mr. Speaker. Representative Bear. Privilege of the floor. Privilege of the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce a couple of my constituents on the gallery to the right: Mark and Patricia Junick, very much involved in the politics in my neck of the woods. Thank you.
The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 41. The reading clerk will read the bill. House Bill 41, sponsored by transportation. Lightweight trailers, permanent registration, an act relating to motor vehicles. Mr. Speaker, your committee number eight, transportation, highways, and military affairs, to whom is referred House Bill 41, lightweight trailers, permanent registration. Respectfully report, same back to the House, with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Eyes. Representatives Berger, Brown, Nemec, Obermuller, O'Hearn, Pendergraf, Smith, Stivar, Wiley. Representative Brown, Chairman. You've heard the reading of the bill. What is your pleasure, Vice, Vice Chairman O'Hearn? I move that when the Committee of the Whole rises to report, it does so with the recommendation that bill number... 40, 41. 41, do pass. And to pass the bill, we've got... There is a standing committee amendment. Is there a, uh, there is a standing committee amendment? I also uh, want to bring to the body standing amendment number one to House Bill. I move standing committee amendment one to House Bill 41. And I call for the question. What is this bill? Question being called on amendment number one. Um, all, the, all those, question having been called, all those in favor of standing committee amendment number one say aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. Ayes have it. Back on the bill, any discussion? Okay, with this, oh, Tony, you got this? Back, back on the bill, question. <laughs> Representative Nemec. Mr. Chairman. All right, I bring uh, House Bill 41. There's an act relating to motor vehicles for permanent registration of light trailers. Uh, those light trailers are uh, under 10,000 pounds. So your little utility trailers and such like that. Um, these trailers would have to be over six years old and basically the uh, the fee would be $100 to have your light utility trailer licensed forever. Stand for any questions or refer to the chairman. Chairman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My apologies for being on the floor, working on a completely separate uh, issue going on here, but um, pretty simple bill. And really what this boils down to is the uh, county clerks, your county clerk came to us and said, hey, look, you guys are charging 10 bucks to renew a driver's or a license plate fee and it's actually costing us somewhere between 11 and 12 dollars to actually administer this entire process to get the sticker out and do everything here's an opportunity for the state to uh, cut costs um, to the to the counties and then also to make their constituents happy and basically what it is is we have these atv trailers right they're a thousand pounds or less single axle not much to them they're gonna cost you maybe a thousand, fifteen hundred bucks. By the time they've depreciated over five years, so you, you get your license plate for five years on the sixth year, it's the same fee forever. And so what they said is, hey, look, what you can do is if you want one of those particular license plates or one of those particular, uh, sorry, trailers licensed forever, you can pay a five times that fee, 50 bucks, and you can license it forever. That's really what it boils down to. And then, you have, we have some other language in here. There, there's a lot of extra language in here about transferring of the, the trailers and how that would occur. Uh, it really gets into the nitty gritty, but ultimately this is a cost savings to your constituents, but it's also a cost savings to the county to not have to sit there and re-register these trailers. Um, there could be potentially a small hit to, you know, the, the highway fund uh, for the small amount of money that we get. So if you take that $10, that's split just like any other property tax. 
So the county's going to get 60% of that, the state's going to get the 40%, and then it's kind of divvied out and gets even smaller from there. So really what this was is that the county clerks and the, the Department of Transportation came to us and said, we really think this is a good idea. So um, this is not a, not a questionable bill in my opinion. I think it's the right thing to do. Stand for any questions. Question being called, all those in favor of chairman? Oh, real question? Well, question being called, all those in favor of Chairman's Brown motion when the Committee of the Whole rises to report, it does so with the recommendation. Well, I thought we had called. Representative Davis. I'd being an owner of many of these type trailers, my question to you is, when the license plate isn't with the trailer after five years, how do you get the new license plate? Have you ever drug a trailer through mud? I mean, it's a valid question. <laughs> so what's the process to get a replacement plate if you pay the lifetime one-time fee. Thank you. I just want to interject real quick, just so just so I don't miss you. If you guys have a question or a comment, please please be up up at the podium so so I don't I don't miss you. Or we get it, we get out of order here. Chairman Brown, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great question. Um, first of all, I would say uh, don't drag your trailer through mud. That that's first one. Um, <laughs> Uh, secondly, um, there is a process and, and there's two things that you want to be careful of here, right? You have your license and you have your registration. So the plate itself, yes, it's that's permanent, but the registration is actually what your permanence is. And that, you know, your, your license plate, your registration is then tied to your VIN number on that particular deal. When you lose a license plate, there is a process, which I just happened to know about because I just had to do it. You would go to your county treasurer and you would file a claim that you have lost or damaged your plate if you want that same number. Otherwise, you would go down to your county uh, treasurer and you would pay the fee, which I believe is $35. I Please don't take that as gospel. I believe it's $35 for a reprint of a new plate. And you would just get a new plate, then that would be tied to your registration and then thus tied to your, uh, your trailer. And then uh, I do wanna make one clarification. It was stated of 10,000 pounds, that is not accurate. It is 1,000 pounds or less. These are the lightweight utility trailers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Question, question being called, all those in favor of Chairman Brown's motion that the committee of the whole rise to report and do so with the rec recommendation that house bill 41 uh do pass all those in favor say aye, aye. <clears throat> all those opposed no house bill house bill 41 passes the committee of the whole the next bill up for our consideration is house bill 71. uh oh sorry chairman chairman harshman oh i'm ready The reading clerk will, will read the bill. Sorry, I thought you were. House Bill 71, sponsored by Representative Brown. Sales tax holiday, back to school, an act relating to sales and use taxes. Mr. Speaker, your committee number three, revenue, to whom was referred House Bill 71, sales tax holiday, back Ready? to school. Respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Eyes. Representatives Bear, Harshman, Locke, Oakley, Swanitzer. Noes, Representatives Byron, Northrop, Storer, Strzok. Representative Harshman, Chairman. Chairman Harshman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that when the Committee of the Whole Rise Support it, do so with the recommendation on House Bill 71 do pass. There is a Standing Committee Amendment. I'm going to turn the explanation of the bill and the Standing Committee Amendment to the good Chairman of Committee Number 8. Chairman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I decided I would talk at all four mics today, so everybody can see me from this side and this angle too. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you House Bill 71. This is a, it's a good little bill. Um, not a lot to explain here, but there is a lot of implications. 
the, the title really says this all. This was brought to me by a constituent who was traveling to the, uh, the big state with a, with a big old star in the middle of it. And they were traveling this year and they said, hey, look, this state has a back to school special that all sales tax is cut for an entire weekend while they're back to school shopping. What a great idea. Why doesn't Wyoming hop on something like this, especially with a billion dollar surplus? Great idea to give some, a little bit of a break to your constituents. And I thought, you know what? I like this. Well, it just so happens that there's another bill very, very similar to this making its way through at the other body, but my bill's going first and I like my bill better. So ladies and gentlemen, what this bill does, I'll walk you through the bill very, very quickly. Uh, if you go to page two, we really start getting into what is what are we gonna exempt? And this comes into a little bit of a discussion of whether or not this is gonna impose a little bit of a, a burden on some of our retailers. But what I will tell you is there are 16 other states that already have a similar program and very, very similar program in, in statute already, and they are able to process this program without any problem. So my assumption is the majority of your larger retailers are gonna be able to attack this with no problem. They're gonna be able to walk into this and just have the codes and the programming ready to go. But we go into this and we say it's the first weekend in August beginning at 12.01 on the first Friday and ending at 11.59 immediately following Sunday. So we give three day weekend and what we say is any clothing of $100 or more, computer hardware uh, of 1,500 or more, any computer software of $100 or more, school supply or sports equipment with the sales price of $50 or more, clothing and accessories, um, sales of an item purchased for resale, those, those are all exempted. You can't have those. If somebody wants to bring in an amendment, I'm not gonna fight you. Um, then we go down into uh, page four and five, which is basically the exact same language, and we're talking about online retailing here as well. And ultimately what this does is it provides your constituents, the, the fiscal note on the back uh, was brought up in committee was, you know, the average person's gonna spend about 600 bucks getting their kid back to school, add Laramie County's tax rate, that's 6%. Well, that's only $24. Well, in my opinion, that's $24 that somebody can put in their gas tank. That's $24 that they can take their family out to eat. That's $24 that they get to keep in their pocket instead of giving it to the government. So. This is a, a very small process in the way that we move forward, and it's 1.6 million uh, to the state, 1.7 or 1.7 million to the state, 1.6 million to your uh, local counties and, and cities on their sales tax revenue. Uh, but in my opinion, that's 3.3 million dollars that doesn't belong to the government, belongs back in your constituents' pockets, and this is money that can stay with them as we move forward. So, uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I don't see anybody running to the mics, but I see my good former chairman of revenue ready to attack, so. <laughs> chairman Zwanit, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think there's an amazing standing committee amendment on this bill and just wanted to make sure we weren't gonna miss that. <laughs> good call, thank you. Oh. Chairman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, my apologies. Uh, great standing committee amendment. Um, the discussion in this committee was, how do we know if this will even work? Will people even take advantage of it? So there was a great standing committee amendment to put in a four year sunset to take a look at this and see whether or not we get some good information on this and whether or not it even benefits. Um, you know, the fiscal note says $3.3 million. Maybe nobody takes advantage of it. My suspicion based off of what I heard from a couple other states that I had talked to with this is it's a huge deal to a lot of people and they take advantage of this very seriously. They, they pretty much time their school shopping to, to align with this weekend and it's a, it's a boon for them. So um, what this standing committee amendment does is it takes it out for a, I believe four years. Uh, and so until July 1st, 2027 um, is when it would be there. And so uh, I would ask for the question on the standing committee amendment if nobody has any questions on the sunset date. Question being called, um, all those in favor of standing committee amendment number one say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. <clears throat> Back on the bill. <laughs> Chairman Washup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question. I believe I heard the testimony saying that the major retailers would have no problem adapting uh, and I just think about the, the small businesses in a lot of our communities. Um, you know, are we, by this provision, are we incentivizing, almost forcing 
people from some of our smaller communities to drive to the next town that's got the big, big stores. Chairman Harshman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I think there's uh, there's some more to this story. It, it, it is a little bit cumbersome for, was the testimony for businesses because you have to recalculate your system for three days or whatever that is. It's probably not insurmountable, but that's an issue. And, you get, and then you're gonna have to go back in and recode it. But I just want us to think more broadly about our tax uh, system. And we're really blessed, you know, we, our third leg of our tax stool is really the per mill trust fund that kicks off about 25% of our revenue. Most states have an income tax. We're one of five that doesn't need that third stool. So we wanna protect our tax base, which is either the lowest or the second lowest, depending on sales tax in the country. And then the lowest or the second lowest property tax in the country. Our property tax, net property tax, is six tenths of 1%. You know, the average property tax in Wyoming is less than a cable TV bill. But let's talk about this sales tax. The good state of Texas, I think I can say other states now, we changed our rules. Their state tax is 6.25%. Our state tax is 4%. Their locals added on is 8.2. Ours is 5.3 average. So they're almost three pennies higher sale tax than us. And then they tax nearly 200 services. We tax about 53. And we all know this, you go get your hair cut, you maybe buy a comb or some shampoo, you pay tax on the shampoo, but not on your haircut. You have somebody come to your yard, mow it, or pick up your dog poop, you don't pay tax on that. Texas taxes that. And so we have this sales tax that is, I remember a good former revenue chairman used to kind of sit over here and he'd always hold his hands up and talk. It used to be 50 years ago, we bought about 60 to 70% goods and about 30% services. That thing has slowly shifted now. We're a service-based economy. Most of our money is 70% is going to buy services. We don't tax any services. But this little bit we do tax on some goods, I want us to think about that burden. Because we got to keep, you know, I mean, and, I, and we all love the idea of this. Uh, I voted for it in committee, of course, just to my fellow chairman, so we could maybe even talk about this. Uh, but I think we got to be really careful. I think we ought to think about how do we protect our system and how do we ensure we never have an income tax and how do we keep modernizing our sales tax. some point, we're going to have to tax a few services. We just are. It probably won't be the 67th or the 68th or the 69th, probably when most of us are gone. Well, let's protect this non-income tax thing that we have going, and we do that by not eroding our sales tax base. So, although I like the spirit of the bill, certainly like the good chairman, sorry, I'm going to vote no on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Rodriguez Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, rising in support of the bill uh, during a time of uh, severe inflation and um, families are hurting. I mean, we've got $6 eggs here. School shopping is really, really expensive. Um, I can attest to that as a mom, and I can tell you in the northern part of the state where I live, um, families go over the border uh, to the, the nearby state because there are no taxes there. And that's where they do their school shopping. So I see this as an incentive and um, I'm in support of the bill. Thank you. Representative Oakley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I rise in support. We, we heard this uh, in committee and, and I, I guess I wanted, what I wanted to talk about was the, the discussion about it being difficult for, for some stores. And that was something that I was concerned about. Um, and I discussed a possible opt out and we heard from um, the department that deals with our money that that would be against a, a streamlined sales tax agreement that we are um, statutorily that we are in. Um, but then I started thinking about it and the reality is, I, I mean, I think there would be a big boon to businesses because 
I mean, I, I think the stores would be flooded. So, so also, I think it would be good good for our local businesses, even if it, you know, is is kind of a pain to deal with those uh, those three days of changing the taxes and doing those calculations. But, but overall, I think it's a it's it. It's it's a feel good for our for our constituents and and maybe some help to people who are on the lower side of things. So I stand in support. Representative Heiner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you look on the fiscal report on the back page, it's divided into two categories: the impact that the state would feel, but also the impact which would be felt by our communities and counties and I know our county commissioners are on their way or hopefully on their way to be here but uh, we're attempting to influence the tax and revenue structure for people that are not here right now they're not voting on this and two and a half two two and a half centuries ago there was a little party they had over tea that, about taxation without representation this is the very first side of that it's removing taxes without having remo removing taxes and revenue without those uh, in individuals or entities having a say in that. So maybe we ought to consult with our with our counterparts on the county level and the municipal municipal level, because we're while we're in session, we're going to deal with two big a couple of revenue sources for our local communities. This being one of them could be quite a quite, you know, maybe not as big as the other one, which is property tax. So uh, I, I believe we should b just be careful here and evaluate the consequences for the entire gamut and not only for the state. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Hornock. Mr. Chairman, first I'd like to uh, thank the good representative for explaining the bill in a place where I didn't have to bump and turn around and look at the back. Uh, but. Um, Secondly, I'm just wondering if there was any pushback from retailers, from online retailers, or if they if they had any uh, difficulty with something like this, or if you you heard from any of them in committee. Thank you, Chairman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the lively discussion. So, first and foremost, I want to thank the good Chairman of Revenue. Uh, and I'd like to remind him there is a bill sitting on his table right now that could be brought back to his committee that does exactly what he talked about, about expanding our tax base and, and having a great discussion that I'd love to bring to this body. So if, uh, if he's so inclined, we could certainly have that discussion. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, to, to the good representative from the west side of the state, um, $1.6 million to I just divided it by the 99 municipalities. Um, that, that's not even accurate because then we have the 23 counties that get their share, but that equates to like $16,000 per city. I'm pretty certain our cities and towns can get away from $16,000 for the spare change that, uh, that they're working with to, to help our families a little bit. So I, I think the, the unintended consequence was certainly thought through on my side of things. I see that it's gonna be a, a tax cut, but I would also venture to say that this is this is money back into your constituents' pockets, not to keep funding government all the time. And boy, howdy, you don't hear me saying that very often. So, um, I uh, I think this is a, a good little bill that that moves us forward. And then to the the good representative, uh, new representative from this capital city here, um, there was no discussion necessarily from retailers themselves or anybody uh, themselves. And I, I would venture to guess that's because they were open, right, or they were working and they did not have the capability of being here. Um, the department that oversees our revenue uh, did explain that there would be some, some worries on their end when it comes to auditing these businesses, that they may not have collected sales tax or they may have collected when they shouldn't have or something along those lines. Um, I think that's a work in progress and I think that as, as time moves through, um, nobody's going to get in trouble for this, you know, unless it's an egregious error and they're just taxing everything all the way through. Um, but. Again, 16 states already have something very similar. There's another 10 that have uh, an expanded version of this. Um, it's, it's a pretty simple process when you put it into practice. And I think once you get through the first year, the second year, uh, it becomes even easier to, to work through. So I do also see another chairman at the mic, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'll stand for more questions. Chairman Eklund. Mr. Chairman, thank you. So years ago, I, I sat in on a tax seminar and 
they were pretty insistent that one of the most fair taxes you have is sales tax. Um, and they looked through them in a variety of different ways. And I think we've, I, I'm looking back at that and I'm trying to, we've, we've talked about removing exemptions. Every time you get an exemption, it's hard to remove those exemptions because people come to depend on that. Um, some of this is fairly vague as to who's going to be going to the store because, uh, um, and who's going to be buying the school supplies. I'm, I, I don't know how many people would use it. It sounds like a great plan. We have plenty of money now, so let's just do it. But I've been in, in what I would call three different recessions here. And a couple of our older members have been here, seen more of them than that. And, and uh, a couple of years ago, we didn't really know how we were gonna fund things. We weren't talking about removing sales tax in any way. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm kind of torn, but I think we need to think long and hard, probably talk to your, your county treasurer um, a little bit about it. And, and, and $16,000 would fund some of our, is a whole budget of some of our small schools. So it might be significant. Representative Alleman. Mr. Chairman, any day we can cut a tax, I'm all in. Except on this one. The, <laughs> the, the, the small stores, the mom and pop stores, who may not even sell school supplies, but they may sell a handful of pencils to a guy. Is there a fine for them or they're breaking the law? Is you know, I, I just worry about the small mom and pop stores that like the, where, where I buy fuel every now and then I'll buy a pen. Is that pen that one week a year not taxed? Thank you. Representative Knapp. Mr. Chairman, thank you. You know, we've heard a lot this session about making very difficult decisions in one of the things I'm always concerned with is we're a policy body. We're a policy body. And if we start making decisions bill by bill by bill, then we have problems. We're not a victim of Wyoming taxes. We're a victim of inflation caused by policy. Not our policies, national policies. We cannot chase our tail on this. We have two ways of taxing in Wyoming for the, for the individual, sales tax and property tax. Services that we provide are far and above what we pay in taxes as individuals. But the perception as citizens sometimes is that we just pay too much taxes, whether it's local, whether it's federal. But in reality, Wyoming has done an excellent job from preventing our own citizens from paying those taxes, including an income tax. I don't want to get there. So as each individual decision comes up, I ask this body to remember our policy because I want to avoid a Wyoming income tax. And every other year, we get concerned about losing any amount of money because we can't afford our budget. And then we get bailed out by whether it's ARPA dollars, which is another bad federal policy of giving back to us because they've caused inflation. <laughs> so I would love to have a tax holiday. I believe that people are hurting. People are hurting out there because of policy. So let's not get confused and give a tax holiday when we provide plenty of services for not a lot of taxes. And we need to explain that to our citizens versus chase our tail. Thank you. Chairman Burkhart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I do like this concept of giving a tax holiday. I don't think this bill does it. Um, and if you look at the computer equipment, this tax holiday doesn't apply just to students. It applies to the sales in this period of time. 
So if you take a student going to our good university and they're in a technical program, $1,500 is probably not going to buy them the computer they need. And if they buy one that's for $1,510, they don't get this break, but someone who buys one for $1,490 does. I think it'd be much better off just give the credit for any sale at 1500 or below, those numbers below, not that they can't exceed it. Um, software, there's more goofy software out there than, than you can imagine. And we've just given a tax break to buy games. Uh, and I know people will use it. Our online retailers, I can tell you what I would do if I was an online retailer and I saw this, I'd just cancel all online sales for those two or three days. I don't want to fool with it. And that, the addition is, is the excise tax portion. Excise taxes are generally paid by businesses that have a tax certificate. So they go in, they buy, an, uh, buy a drill at the local hardware store, give them their tax certificate. They don't pay taxes to the store, they pay it directly. And I don't think it addresses those issues. I like the concept, but I think this bill needs a lot of work uh, for that reason, those reasons. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Andrew. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On and in support of this bill, I have never voted for a tax in my entire legislative career. And I feel like voting against this bill would actually be voting for a tax. On another note, I run a company that has to constantly change what we're taxing and what tax rates apply to that. And it's honestly, you know, it's an annoyance, but it's not something that's horribly difficult to turn on and off. And I think that any business who was presented an opportunity to participate in this would be happy to do it. Thank you. Representative Storr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On and against the bill. Uh, you know, I think this is a, a feel-good bill that doesn't really do what we want it to do. Uh, Wyoming has a pretty regressive tax policy, and uh, while this might put $20 or $40 in a family's pocket, um, uh, it's not going to do anything to address the fact that we ask our low-income and middle-income families to pay a much higher percentage of their income in in state taxes than we do for wealthy folks. Um, I agree with Representative Burkhart, Chairman Burkhart, that you know it's kind of an administrative uh, 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 nightmare for both retailers and our administration. And um, and I think it's often that you'll see retailers will actually bump the price of of goods that are um, in order to take advantage of people coming in to buy these articles um, and in the end families won't really benefit very much at the end so on and against the bill thank you question being called all those in favor of chairman's brown <clears throat> chairman oh, harshman thing yeah was, uh, chairman harshman's motion that when the committee of the whole rise to report it does so with the recommendation that house bill 71 do pass all those say aye all those in favor say aye, aye. all those opposed say no. no the bill does not pass uh house bill um, division being called all those in favor please stand Division being called, all those, in all those in favor, please stand. Once again, division being called, all those in favor, please stand.
All those opposed, please stand. More than 22. Bill fails. Pursuant to House Rules 6-6B, the bill having failed a voice vote, a standing division vote is required. All those in favor, please stand. We did that, we did that. Having failed standing division vote, voter roll call vote is required. The chief, the chief clerk will call roll, the roll. Alleman? No. Allred? No. Andrew? Aye. Angelos? Aye. Banks? No. Bear? Aye. Berger? No. Brown? Aye. Burkhart? No. Byron? No. Chadwick? No. Chestick? No. Plowston? No. Conrad? Crago? No. Davis? No. Eklund? No. Haroldson? No. Harshman? No. Heiner? No. Henderson? No. Hornock? No. Jennings? No. Knapp? No. Larson Lloyd? No. Larson JT? No. Lawley? No. Locke? No. Nyman? Newsom excused. Nicholas. Nemec. Northrop. Oakley. Obermuller. O'Hearn. Olson. Ottman. Pendergraft. Penn. Provenza? No. Rodriguez Williams? Aye. Sherwood? No. Shh. Singh? Aye. Slagle? Aye. Smith? Aye. Stith? No. Storer? No. Strock? No. Stivar? Aye. Tarver? No. Trujillo? Walters, no. Ward, Aye. Washett, no. Western, no. Winter, no. Wiley, no. Yin, no. is one answer Dan, Aye. is one answer Dave, no. Speaker Summers, no. are there any changes? Closing vote, vote closed. 23 aye, 38 no, one excused. Having failed a roll call vote, <clears throat> the bill is indefinitely postponed. House Bill 71 is indefinitely postponed. I'd like to rec recognize the Majority Floor Leader, Mr. Majority Thank floor. you, Mr. Chairman. I move the Committee of the Whole Rise and Report. I've heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? No. <laughs> the motion carries. The reading clerk will read the Committee of the Whole report. 
Mr. Speaker, your Committee of the Whole, having had under consideration bills on general file, begs leave to report as follows. House Bill 14, do pass. House Bill 11, do pass. House Bill 26, do pass. House Bill 45, do pass. House Bill 44, do pass. We beg leave to rise and return again at 215. Considering House Bill 7, do pass. House Bill 33, do pass amended. House Bill 41, do pass amended. House Bill 71 failed to pass Committee of the Whole and was indefinitely postponed. Representative Wiley, Chairman. I move the adoption of the Committee of the Whole report. You've heard the motion. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. All right. Representative Wiley. All right. Yay. House will come to order. Our next, our next order of business is to uh, fix my mistake from earlier today. It's House Bill 50. It was part of the consent list. We've already voted on it. Now is the time where if you oppose House Bill 50, which was the uh, solid waste cease and transfer uh, funding bill for the year, for the session, the chief clerk will for any of those who wish to change their vote from I to no, please are stand. Any, are there any changes on House Bill 50? Winter? I to no. Further changes? Closing? Vote closed. 60 I, one no, one excused. House Bill 50, having received a majority of the vote of the elected members of the House, House Bill 50 has passed the House. Do we have some messages from the Senate? Messages from the Senate. <clears throat> Message 125, Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading by the vote indicated. Senate file 14, Wyoming National Guard professional malpractice liability. Ayes 28, noes 1, excused 1. Message 126, Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading by the vote indicated. Senate file 15, military leave for state employees. Ayes 30, excused 1. Message 127, Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading by the vote indicated. Senate file, Senate file 18, benefits for spouses of law enforcement members. Ayes 29, noes 1, excused 1. Message 128, Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading by the vote indicated. Senate file 25. District and prosecuting attorneys, bar license requirement. Ayes 30, excused 1. Message 129. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading by the vote indicated. Senate file 26. Psychology interjurisdictional compact. Ayes 23, noes 7, excused 1. Message 130. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading by the vote indicated. Senate file 31, adjacent land resources data trespass repeal. 
ayes 28, noes 2, excused 1. Message 131. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading in an amended form by the vote indicated. Senate file 32, prohibiting drones over penal institutions. Ayes 26, noes 4, excused 1. Message 132. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading by the vote indicated. Senate file 36, investment funds committee, selection panel amendments. Ayes 29, noes 1, excused 1. Message 133. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading in an amended form by the vote indicated. Senate file 37. Podiatry, medical services, Medicaid. Ayes 21, noes 9, excused 1. Message 134. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading by the vote indicated. Senate File 55, Chancery Court Vacancies, Extension Amendment. Ayes 30, excused 1. Message 135. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading by the vote indicated. Senate File 69, Electronic Records Retention. Ayes 30, excused 1. Message 136. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading by the vote indicated. Senate File 71, State Loan and Bond Programs. Ayes 30, excused 1. Message 137. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading in an amended form by the vote indicated. Senate File 95, Moon Landing Day. Ayes 26, noes 4, excused 1. Message 138. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading by the vote indicated. Senate File 10, Licensed Professional Counselor Compact. Ayes 23, noes 7, excused 1. Sincerely, Ellen Thompson, Senate Chief Clerk. Committee announcements. Reports from standing committees, excuse me. House Bill 10, sponsored by Judiciary. County officers, bond amounts, and surety requirement, an act relating to county officers. Mr. Speaker, your committee number one judiciary, to whom is referred House Bill 10, county officers, bond amounts, and surety requirement, respectfully reports same back to the House with the recommendation to do pass with the following amendments. Ayes, Representatives Chestick, Crago, Haroldson, Jennings, Nemec, Oakley, Provenza, Rodriguez Williams, Washit. Represent Chairman Washit. House Bill 15, sponsored by Judiciary. County authority to dissolve museum boards, clarification, an act relating to counties. Mr. Speaker, your committee number one judiciary to whom is referred House Bill 15, county authority to dissolve museum boards, clarification, respectfully reports same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, Representatives Chestick, Crago, Nemec, Oakley, Provenza, Rodriguez Williams, Washit, Nose, Representatives Haroldson, Jennings, Representative Washit, Chairman. House Bill 67, sponsored by Representative Stivar. Special license plate decals, women's veterans. An act relating to motor vehicles. Mr. Speaker, your committee number nine, Minerals, Business and Economic Development, to whom was referred House Bill 67, special license plate decals, women veterans, respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, Representatives Banks, Burkhart, Conrad, Heiner, Knapp, Larson, Lawley, Tarver, Nose, Representative Western, Representative Burkhart, Chairman. House Bill 86, sponsored by Blockchain. Disclosure of private cryptographic keys, an act relating to digital assets. Mr. Speaker, your committee number seven, corporations, elections, and political subdivisions to whom was referred House Bill 86. Disclosure of private cryptographic keys. Respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, Representatives Chadwick, Haroldson, Harshman, Knapp, Olson, Ottman, Wiley, Yin. Excused, Representative Newsom. Representative Olson, Chairman. House Bill 94, sponsored by Representative Rodriguez-Williams. Board of Parole, Wyoming Residency. 
an act relating to criminal procedure. Mr. Speaker, your committee number nine, Minerals, Business, and Economic Development, to whom's referred House Bill 94, Board of Parole, Wyoming Residency, respectfully reports same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. Eyes, Representatives Banks, Burkhart, Conrad, Heiner, Knapp, Larson, Lawley, Tarver, Western. Representative Burkhart, Chairman. House Bill 96, sponsored by Representative Crago. Transfer on death deed insurance coverage. An act relating to insurance and probate. Mr. Speaker, your committee number one judiciary, to whom was referred House Bill 96, transfer on death deed insurance coverage. Respectfully report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Eyes, Representatives Chestick, Crago, Haroldson, Jennings, Nemec, Oakley, Provenza, Washit. Excused, Representative Rodriguez Williams. Representative Washit, Chairman. Does that clear the deck then, Mr. Majority Floor Leader? Mr. Mr. Speaker. Please. I move the House adjourn until 10 a.m. tomorrow, Thursday, January the 19th, 2023. Committee announcements. Chairman Harshman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your committee number three will meet tomorrow morning, Thursday, January 19th, in the East Room number three, our usual spot, the east side, the house side, where the sun always comes up. Okay. We will hear, Mr. Speaker, House Bill 80, Medical Treatment Opportunity Act, Medicaid Reform, and if time allows, House Bill 77, School Finance, Average Daily Membership. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chairman Eklund. Mr. Speaker, your committee number five, Agriculture, uh, waters and state lands will meet tomorrow morning at eight o'clock in our usual room, uh, which is uh, south of the East Rooms and uh, no, north of the East Rooms. And we will hear House Bill 22, state land lease deficiencies, House Bill 21, state land use of qualification requirements, House Bill 20, land exchanges priority, and House Bill 106, eminent domain, wind energy collector systems, if there's time. Vice Chair Western. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your committee number six, Travel, Recreation, Wildlife, and Cultural Resources will be meeting tomorrow at noon recess to hear two bills, House Bill 76, licensing boards amendments, and House Bill 104, hunting of predatory animals amendments, both carried over from our Tuesday meeting. Chairman Nicholas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your House Appropriations Committee will meet at noon tomorrow and hear House Bill 25, School Capital Construction Transfers, House Bill 53, State Official Compensation Commission, House Bill 125, Second Veterans Home, and House Bill 97, Chancery Courts. And the, the, the committee will consider um, House Draft Bill 496, which is School Foundation Program Reserve Accounts. Your joint appropriations will meet tomorrow at eight o'clock uh, to consider the formal draft of the government appropriations bill. Chairman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your House Committee number eight, Transportation, Highways, Military Affairs will meet tomorrow 15 minutes upon adjournment so everybody can get some food. We will hear four bills, House Bill 57, Armed Forces Amendments, House Bill 38, Wyoming National Guard Member Referral Program, House Bill 59, Wyoming National Guard Tuition Benefits, and House Bill 56, Purple Star Schools. Any other committee announcements? Representative Obermuller, do you have a privilege? A privilege, Mr. Speaker? Please. Uh, immediately, immediately upon adjournment, uh, we will be conducting a Republican House caucus uh, in the Capitol Extension in the conference room. A short meeting tonight to uh, 
cover a few issues. If you would please all be there, I would be very happy about that. Thank you. All right, I think that's it. Uh, one, just one last thing uh, before I call for the question on the motion is uh, there's there was one individual told me it was the the mics were getting kind of blocked up with those chatting and hanging around so remember when we're in d deep debate you know to kind of kind of stay back from the mic if you're not at the mic to talk so with that uh, all those in favor of the majority floor leader's motion signify by saying aye, aye. all those opposed no. we the motion passes. We stand adjourned until 10 a.m. tomorrow, January 19th, 2023.